In recent years, the ties between Pentagon and the Hollywood film studios have stretched well beyond the realm of show business. One of the most recent examples of this trend can be found here in downtown Los Angeles at the Institute for Creative Technologies. Founded in 1999, the ICT is a laboratory of the future, a microcosm of the latest manifestation of the MIMENET. Based at the University of Southern California, the ICT's aim is to develop battlefield simulation technology for the US military. Technology and simulations that seek to improve the training of soldiers, tactical decision making, and the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. ICT as an institution arrives in 1999 at the point where um, you know, it no longer becomes possible to prosecute war or have a military industrial complex without very intimately managing those relationships. So ICT brought together you know, Hollywood filmmakers and script writers along with military personnel and military theorists, toy makers, video game makers, and kind of brought them all into this common clearinghouse where they could exchange ideas. And you might see it as a kind of Rosetta Stone of the military entertainment complex. It's where um, a lot of the interchange happens. I mean, if deals are going to be struck or if new technologies are going to be traded back and forth, it happens at ICT. Uh, the Institute for Creative Technologies is a research unit at the University of Southern California, and it was established in 1999 as a Army-sponsored, university-affiliated research center. Uh, the objective of the Institute is uh, really to explore from a fundamental perspective as well as an applied perspective the whole idea of immersion, an immersive interactive digital technologies. Uh, it was started really with the motivation of uh, leveraging what was going on in the 90s when you, all the video games were coming out and uh, there was actually a National Research Council study uh, that, that looked at video games and, uh, and, and the technologies that were emerging as well as virtual reality and storytelling as uh, things that the Department of Defense might want to consider when they think about raising the bar and training. And so there was a recommendation made that they create an institute and it should probably be at a university so that it could be a bridge between the Army and academia and, and industry also. And uh, so the Institute's mission then really is to do basic and applied research in immersive technologies. And so in a, in a sense our motto has been, uh, you know, we're, we're developing these technologies for teaching, training, healing, and helping. And that kind of gives you an idea that we don't confine it just to looking at uh, the basic technologies themselves, but productive ways of using them. Within the Institute we have uh, really a number of different types of researchers. It's very multidisciplinary in nature. And so uh, we have computer scientists and engineers. We have, a, we have a, a clinical psychologist on the staff. We have a, a medical doctor on the staff. Uh, we also have a lot of people who've been in the game industry, uh, either as artists or, or designers or storytellers. And uh, so that's just within the institute, but then we interact with the broader university and the, the talents they have there, and with the Army Research Laboratory, which is uh, our partner in this, this whole col collaboration. And they're very interested in how, people, how humans interact with information. Uh, and, and then we interact with a lot with uh, the end users, uh, potentially, of, of, uh, of the technologies, and that's what inspires us. We, we say we do use-inspired research here. So the, when the DOD uh, established this place, and, and really the sponsorship came from the U.S. Army, uh, they were very interested in how they can improve training and education opportunities. And what they saw from the entertainment industry was, uh, number one, uh, with, with video games, they saw these very inexpensive very interactive platforms that they'd like to be able to take advantage of. They said there's something there. People, uh, they want to play these games, they get addicted to these games, they can't seem to stop playing them. And you know, what is it about that interaction in that, in that environment that uh, draws them in and, and gets them so focused? 
Uh, so there's, there, you know, that's a little piece of the secret sauce that you're trying to figure out was how, you know, what's that engagement that's going on there. Uh, but more broadly, you know, when you talk about filmmakers and storytellers, um, I think that the, the, the big idea there is that humans are, uh, I think we've discovered humans are designed to enjoy stories. We remember stories. We're designed to listen to stories, uh, much more so than maybe just a straight lecture or you know, a bunch of information. And you can recall them later. And so, you know, again, if you want to apply that to adult learning, uh, are there elements of story that you can weave into uh, a lesson uh, that makes it sticky, that makes, makes it more memorable, more engaging? And uh, so that, those are, you know, some of the things we've been teasing apart, you know, in the life of this institute is uh, working with world-class storytellers, uh, designers uh, to create experiences for people that uh, would simulate the real world in some way and then enable them to have to make difficult decisions or, or interact some way in that environment and then have them remember that experience but also learn something from the experience. And the virtual learning scenarios built by the ICT are multifaceted. They include training soldiers to improve tactical decision-making, enabling intercultural learning, and improving better cooperation between soldiers and humanitarian aid workers. One such program, called ELITE, is designed to train military officers' interpersonal skills. By interacting with virtual humans, soldiers can train how to interact with subordinates in complex scenarios for human virtual interfaces that recognize speech and body language. Here, real conversations are role-played to allow soldiers to learn and train before having to face such situations in the field. Another big area is the clinical treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, for exposure therapy. This project here is called Brave Mind, and it's a uh, clinical tool that can help treat service members who have PTSD. Um, and this was developed um, by Dr. Skip Rizzo at the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies. And um, it's a very unique program because what we did was take uh, game graphics, basically, and uh, put them into a head mount display, an early model of a head mount display, put a, a motion tracker on it. Uh, and uh, put those service members who have PTSD into a simulated environment that, that resembles what their traumatic story might be, what those events that are causing their PTSD might have been. Um, and there's uh, several components to this uh, application. One is um, what you see right there, and that's a representation of what's in that headset, which uh, I'm going to ask you to try in a moment. Um, but this panel over here is what we call our clinician's panel, and this is really the, the center of the entire thing. This is where we drive all the events that occur on the screen. So for instance, you know, right now we're, um, the patient is uh, in the position of a driver's seat, uh, and it's a sunny day, but let's say it's not a sunny day. Let's say it's actually going to be nighttime. Uh, I can ask Andrew, who's playing the role of the clinician, to change it to nighttime, and there you go. It just becomes nighttime like that. Um, but let's bring it back to daytime, so it's a little easier. And we can choose different types of times of day too. It can be morning or mi midday or, or late afternoon. Uh, let's go up to the turret. Let's say he wasn't driving, but he was actually in the turret position. So we can move that the patient's view up to the turret now. And with this headset, which I'll have you try on. As you see, as I turn and move this headset, you can look all the way around in this environment. If uh, there's trash on the side of the road, we can put trash on the side of the road. If we need to burn that trash, because a lot of times there was trash burning on the side of the road, we can start that up and that'll just start burning in a second. And there you go. Uh, in fact, we can have a child run across the road. Uh, and that's something we were asked to put in by the military because a lot of times there's a lot of folks have trauma related to seeing children run across the road. They're not allowed to stop. They have to keep rolling because that has been a, those, those situations have occurred where it's been, a, it's been a trap. They stop the vehicle, they get ambushed. That's why. So in this case, this is a, a market, um, just you know, with people around. And, and to show you, give you some idea of the flexibility of this, of this program, for instance, right now you see a lot of men walking through here. There's some women, a couple of children. If I didn't want any men in this market, 
uh, Andrew can just take them out of there like that. Uh, so we've got some kids, some women. If I didn't want women in here, we can take them out. Now we just have kids. There's some military folks probably walking in the back. If I only wanted military, we could just have them. Uh, we can just have any subset of characters that we want. In this case, we'll just throw people back in. And again, the same things apply in terms of environment, the time of day, the environmental factors. We can change all those on the fly, as you can tell right now. Late, late afternoon, nighttime, with a starry sky. Uh, it looks like it's dawn. So there's a lot of flexibility there. If you look to your left, um, that vehicle right there, there's a vehicle-borne IED in there. We're going to set that off. And so you can see all the damage. Now, um, if you use your uh, left stick and move up slightly to it, and look down at the people a little bit, I know you're kind of tilting your head, you'll see that there's really no blood or injury to these people other than the fact that they're on the ground. Um, and that's because we've set it for no injury, basically. So you can't see any injury. Again, this is one of these things where the therapist can decide whether or not we need to show blood or missing limbs and so forth. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to ask Andrew to reset that for me. And we're going to now in introduce a little bit of uh, injury when the explosion goes off. So now the peop you can see there's a little bit of blood there. And actually, it's going to be difficult for you to tilt your head. So you want to get up for one second? And I'm going to take this chair out so you can just and take a half a step back. And you're in the middle now. So that's perfect. So now you can turn your body more easily to look at the people and so forth. So now you can see there's some blood where there wasn't before. And this is on uh, light, is it, Andrew? Yeah, severe is pretty bad where there's missing limbs, there's big pools of blood and so forth. And all the crowd noise, all the babies crying that you hear, that's all controlled by the panel. We can turn any of that off, keep any of it on, whatever may be relevant. Because it's, it's interesting, sometimes, you know, uh, you never really know what you'll remember. You may remember some distinct thing, like a baby crying, so we can put that in. So let's reset that. And uh, let's show you something a little bit more severe, and we'll just, as an example again, and we'll set it off again. And now you see there's definite pools of blood. It's a lot, a lot more graphic. Now, again, it's up to the therapist whether the therapist wants to show all that blood and so forth. A lot of times that's not necessary. Um, the, the sound of the explosion, seeing people down, that's enough to trigger their memory. Um, again, this is all uh, dependent on what the therapist thinks is the best for the patient. That's why there's so much flexibility and customization built into this application. Wearing this headset and being exposed to virtual simulations I felt I had to hearken back to those voices that look at the ICT more critically, particularly to those people who say that it constitutes the latest manifestation of what President Eisenhower had called the military-industrial complex. It's a question I couldn't resist asking Randy Hill directly. I mean, I'm very aware of uh, you know, Eisenhower's caution. I'm actually I'm a great admirer of President Eisenhower, General Eisenhower. Uh, he was a really great leader. And I think his caution was one we need to take you know, into account uh, about the military industrial complex. Um, you know, whether the ICT is somehow contributing to that, uh, I don't, I guess I don't see it that way, partly because I don't see us creating weapon systems that um, we're trying to sell to the world or the government, um, we're, at, we're creating technologies that are really focused more on the human dimension, uh, which has applicability well beyond warfare. Warfare is just one, one particular aspect. Um, you know, we've been focused on, uh, uh, again, how to, how to help people learn better, uh, how to uh, heal people who've been wounded by war which is, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the outcomes of war that uh, we all have to face is that there are a lot of people who are injured, you know, either psychologically or physically by war. Uh, so we've been looking more at how to help people improve their performance, whether it's cognitively or emotionally, physically, 
and uh, and somehow uh, you know try to actually break down barriers in communication. You can see ICT as a kind of microcosm for all the trading of ideas and cross-pollination between the entertainment industries and the military. So academics will brainstorm for ideas about psyops strategies and information operations. Screenwriters will give their ideas about scenarios for future terrorist attacks. Toy makers are getting specifications for new toys um, based on weapons that maybe have, haven't even been manufactured yet. And video game designers are uh, designing virtual environments for training soldiers. So ICT is this place where all of this kind of conversation, all of this consultation happens, and where these ideas go from one sphere to the next. So this partnership does not just benefit the military, but also the commercial sector of game developers, who, while helping generate the latest and most advanced and realistic game simulators for the military, can use this expertise to then release these military simulators and training devices commercially. Which is why all the big entertainment giants from Sony to Sega and Ubisoft are part of the ICT. And it is important to understand that the video game industry today is more lucrative than the film industry. For the last decade or so, video games commercially have easily outdone cinema box offices. For instance, the sales figures of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 have surpassed the top-selling book and movie of the Harry Potter series. In this way, the ICT is a microcosm of much broader trends in military and game industry collaboration, reflecting the mobilization of information age warfare across the entire spectrum of media today. It represents larger trends of a world where games, simulators, and game technologies cross the boundaries between militaries, the defense industry, Hollywood, and the commercial gaming sector.